I'm Lucy, and in the internet studio today is Jesse Spotford. Hello. I'm excited to have you on the show today. Um, thanks for agreeing to do this. Pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. And a little bio. Uh, Jesse is a lecturer in philosophy at the Victoria University of Wellington, uh, whose work explores the moral underpinnings of anarchism. He presents anarchism as a fusion of libertarian and socialist moral principles, arguing that this position is both coherent and plausible, which is an intriguing bio. It, it does make you want to ask more questions. So That's good. Or then I guess we're already off to a good start as far as uh, an interview goes. Um, so I guess to start, can you tell me a little bit what is your job, you know, in the day to day? Sure. So uh, yeah, I'm a lecturer at the University of the Victoria University of Wellington, um, which is one of the major universities in New Zealand. Uh, so I'm primarily tasked with doing a combination of philosophy research and teaching. Um, so my days are split between either writing papers and books or preparing lectures for students and talking to students and working with students, supervising their master's theses, uh, you know, grading their papers, et cetera. So, um, like, what is, what is a course name that you would be teaching? Is it, uh, is it something very specific and academic? They, so they range. So it's, it's a small department. So they have us teaching a whole bunch of different things. So for example, the last trimester, um, I taught, uh, sort of an upper level political philosophy course just called political philosophy, where we covered a bunch of different ideologies, um, you know, the sort of the moral, the moral positions advanced by libertarians, socialists, anarchists, conservatives, nationalists, etc. cetera. Um, and then I also at the same time taught a large intro lecture class called minds, brains, and persons okay. uh, so covering all sorts of things about the nature of the mind and its relationship to the external world. What does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be a person across time? What is the nature of gender, race, sexuality, etc.? That's a lot to cover. <laughs> yeah. So, so cover all sorts of things. And yeah, the next trimester, I'll be teaching an ethics course uh, covering different theories, sort of utilitarian moral theories, and contrasting that with theories that appeal to rights when talking about the moral structure of the world. Um, yeah. So covering all sorts of things. But the primary thing that I'm interested in is political philosophy. Um, yeah, and particularly questions of distributive justice. What is our, you know, what are our moral obligations with respect to each other and the state? Um, and yeah, that's that's my main focus. Can you describe your political views in the in the in the short term right now? And if you had any kind of political journey, how, what are you, and how did you get get here? I guess. Sure. Uh, yeah. So currently, I describe myself as an anarchist, a social anarchist um, of sort of a moderate variety. Um, I have certain heterodox views that uh, other social anarchists wouldn't necessarily like that much, um, but I think I also do a pretty good job of defending a lot of the views that are at the heart of what social anarchists believe. Um, but yeah, I have not always been or considered myself to be an anarchist. Um, yeah, growing up, I actually probably would have thought of myself as more of a communist. Uh, growing, I was probably I was interested in politics from a pretty early age. Um, always consistently left leaning probably you know on the pro you know from pre probably what you consider to be a pr the progressive side of the democratic party in sort of my early years um like i was sort of a started to really get interested in politics around the time of the iraq war and the response mm -hmm. to 9 11 um probably that was probably my first like initial political thought was thinking that the war was just going to be a big mistake uh and I feel, you know, vindicated in that uh, 12 year old me you know, Indeed. Should have, should have some, had a little bit better instincts than many of the neocons <laughs> who got us embroiled in that. Um, but uh, yeah, and then I in high school, I got interested in, in policy debate, uh, which I think is a path for many people who become later interested in politics. And that sort of exposed me to an array of radical views that I'd never before encountered or heard about. Um, and uh, yeah, after participating in that for a little while, I became pretty interested in various critiques of capitalism. Uh, nothing to, uh, you know, looking back, there's a lot of that happens in debate that I would consider to be sort of pseudo philosophy, um, sort of things that look a little bit like philosophy, but don't actually have the sort of technical rigor uh, of the kind of stuff that I'm now interested in. 
Um, but nonetheless, it sort of exposed me to ideas and possibilities that I'd never considered. And I became very critical of capitalism as the result of reading some of the work uh, that we were covering. Um, so yeah, I sort of thought of myself as just a pretty strict, strict communist or socialist. Um, and then in college, I took a political philosophy class and encountered the work of some actual contemporary socialist philosophers, um, particularly a socialist philosopher named G.A. Cohen. Uh, and G.A. Cohen does this thing where he's sort of known for defending socialism as a moral theory, but engaging very directly with libertarian moral thought, taking libertarians extremely seriously wow. <laughs> uh, and trying to really sort of argue against them in terms that they would accept. Um, because in a way, I mean, he's an interesting figure. He was a he was a sort of dog, sort of dogmatic Marxist through much mm -hmm. of his life. Um, he wrote a whole book trying to defend Marx's theory of history uh, in sort of an idiosyncratic way. And then later in life sort of moved away from that a little bit toward defending socialism more as an understood as an egalitarian theory. Okay. Um, but he, uh, yeah, as part of that process, he read the libertarian philosopher, Robert Nozick, and he sure. describes the experiences. Basically, he's, I think he uses the language of, you know, it woke me from my dogmatic slumbers. Uh, and he says, all of a sudden, you know, I saw this view defended uh, and defended in terms that should be actually very challenging to Marxists because he saw there actually being a lot of similarities between libertarian thought and Marxist thought um, in, in certain ways. He thought he actually saw sort of self-ownership as being the central concept to both, um, which is sort of an interesting position to take. Uh, so he was very exercised as a result by libertarianism. He saw this as a real challenge that was actually in a way more challenging to Marxists and socialists than, uh, you know, than he thought other ideologies would be. Um, and so he ended up devoting a lot of his later work to trying to contest libertarianism and contest it on its own terms. Uh, so, for example, he would argue that, you know, libertarians care a lot about freedom and trying to promote people's freedom. Um, but if we understand freedom as option limitation, uh, then actually we see that people's freedom is significantly constrained under theories of under systems where there's private property, because private property functions as a constraint upon your freedom. Um, right. You have all these different people. They all have their own little territories that they control. They basically, you know, they set up actual, you know, sometimes literal walls. Uh, mm. But, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be a literal wall. Nonetheless, you sort of can't use people's property and you feel very sort of you become slowly fenced in by other people's property. And granted, people will, you know, they might let you use their property if you exchange things to them that they value. Uh, but he's going to say something like, well, then as a result, your freedom becomes a function of how much how of the degree to which you have valuable things to exchange with right, other right. people. So, for example, how much money you have money actually sort of functions as you know, your freedom is proportionate to the amount of money you have in a society. Um, and he's like, that should be something, you know, if, you, if you're concerned about freedom, that should be something that sort of troubles you. Uh, if it turns out that some people's freedom is significantly limited because they don't have much money. Uh, right. So that kind of approach to arguing with libertarians. Uh, and, you know, I, I sort of encountered this. and I was like, oh, this is sort of a neat trick, you know, trying to argue against libertarianism on its own terms, starting with libertarian premises and then mm -hmm. showing that actually maybe that should point you toward uh, egalitarian conclusions or socialist conclusions. And, and I, I, I sort of viewed this initially as kind of like, yeah, sort of a debating tactic. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this is a neat debating tactic, you know, showing that libertarians should be, should be more sympathetic to socialism on their own terms. But then the more I kind of thought about these arguments, the more I kind of came to be like, oh yeah, I think that he's right that libertarian premises do point towards socialist conclusions. But also I think the libertarian premises are right. Right. Like, I don't just think that it's like a trick yeah. to kind of like, oh, I've sort of, you know, hoisted you by your own petard. I'm like, actually, no, these principles, these, the libertarians are right about all this. And he's right that it leads to socialist conclusions. So really, you should sort of embrace a fusion of these two views and be, both, like a, be a libertarian socialist, somebody who starts from libertarian premises, but ends up being an egalitarian uh, or in, and rejecting private property. So and that was kind of the path. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that. Um... People so rarely try to address libertarians in that way that I feel like that sort of flatter flattery would um, might be very effective. I'm always no, def it's it's gotten far. I've seen a few people characterize him as libertarians' favorite socialist. Um, of course, right? Which yeah, and I, I think it's you know I think it's fair. And I I feel like I just sort of try to fill a similar position. Yeah, I've taken libertarian arguments very seriously because I'm sympathetic to so many libertarian positions. Um, and, uh, and I think there's, so yeah, I think there's a nice, uh, interesting sort of 
reciprocity there where, you know, Cohen respects the libertarians and they respect him as a result. Um, yeah. And I think that that, that's a, it's sort of a nice thing. And it, uh, I think has been philosophically productive and mm-hmm. resulted in actual real progress being made, um, in terms of trying to put these two different positions into conversation. Well, I can either ask what social anarchism is exactly to you, but, um, I also, I mean, you, you just, you just hit on a lot of things and I want to know, yeah, yeah, you know, which could be the entire, the entire interview could be about what, how does, how do libertarian premises point to socialism? I mean, that's, that's a giant thing I can ask about. Um, well, but, in, a, in a way that's, that's also how I characterize the social anarchist position. So there might be some hmm, sort of okay. union here hmm. because in a way, I think that my sort of presentation of social anarchism, I think the, the moral heart of social anarchism is a fusion of these different principles and positions. Uh, you know, it's, so I, in the, so I've written a book recently that's just been published with Cambridge university press called social anarchism and the rejection of moral tyranny. And in that I sort of try to present what I take to be the social anarchist position. Uh, and I present it basically as a conjunction of five different moral principles. Um, some of which are libertarian, some of which are egalitarian, uh, or socialist in character. And then what the book tries to show is it tries to show that if you, you should take the libertarian principles, if you start with them, then you end up with the socialist principles. So it's sort of like social anarchism is just this set of principles, but they actually all fit together. There's these sort of strong logical connections between them, such that it's not just this arbitrary collection of, oh, I like this principle and I like this principle. Let's put them all in the shopping cart, right? Rather it's, oh, I like this principle and because I like it, I'm now actually committed to these other views. Um, so I'm trying to show it's this big coherent package, um, despite the fact that most people think that libertarianism and socialism are actually opposed. Li- they do. Opinions. Or, I mean, and some people probably think don't want egalitarianism messing up their principles and vice versa. So if you're, um, if you're doing a buffet, um, which I'm, I mean, that makes me want to read the whole book. Um, and we will obviously link to it. Um, so, yeah, so basically, in my view, I think that there's sort of five principles that often animate social anarchists, or at the very least, if should animate social anarchists. Um, I think the first, uh, probably least controversial one is, I think, anarchists of all kinds should be philosophical anarchists. Um, so a philosophical anarchist holds that there are no existing legitimate states. Where legitimacy is often used as a term of art. So, you know, people typically in philosophy, when people talk about a state being legitimate, what they mean is that the state has a specific sort of moral power to oblige its subjects. So the thought is that a state passes some law, uh, say it says, you know, you can't drive above 60 miles per hour. Um, The thought is that when it passes that law, if it's legitimate, then that means that now actually you have a moral obligation to follow that law, uh, simply because it's the law, right? So now if if you speed and you go 80 miles per hour, uh, maybe even if you're not endangering anyone, you know, it's totally safe. It's the middle of the night. You're in the middle of the desert. No one's around. There's no risks at all. Uh, the thought is you're still actually doing something morally wrong simply in virtue of the fact that you're violating the law. So the state has this sort of special ability to impose obligations upon people. Uh, that's what a legitimate state is. And then the philosophical anarchist basically says, so th- if that's what a legitimate state is, then there are no legitimate states. No state actually has this kind of moral power to make you obey the law. Granted, you might have independent reasons to comply with the law. So there are certain laws that are just good laws. For example, there are laws that say you can't murder people. And indeed, an- philosophical anarchists will say you are obliged to not murder people. But that's not because of the law. The law is sort of totally irrelevant, right? You just have independent natural People have natural rights against you, for example, that give you strong moral reasons not to murder them. Uh, And whether or not it's a law is just irrelevant. So that's the philosophical anarchist position. And specifically, I argue that the reason for people should be philosophical anarchists uh, is because there's, they should hold what's called a consent theory of legitimacy. And the idea here is it's like, okay, well, so here's this, a legitimate state is one that can oblige you by uh, passing laws. Well, what what would enable what would make a state legitimate? What would give it this power to oblige you? And a natural answer, I think, is if you consent to being bound in this way. If you say you made a promise to the state, you say, I promise that I will do whatever you say. Well, now 
it then seems that the state says, okay, well, now no driving over 80 miles per hour. I think it's plausible to think, well, actually, yeah, now you are obligated to not drive over 80 miles per hour. You said you would, you know, you said you do whatever they said. They said you can't do this. So now you can't do this. Um, so in, in other words, consent theorists think that consent is a very plausible basis for acquiring obligations. But absent con- such consent, it seems like you don't have those obligations. It seems like consent is a crucial difference maker in terms of what you're oblig- who you're obligated to comply with. Um, and so the thought is, yeah, if you, given that states have not gotten anybody's consent, that's why they're not legitimate. Um, so that's sort of the starting view. So the thought is, yeah, if, if, if in fact I'd made a pledge freely and of my own accord, and I promised you know, the United States government that I will comply with its laws, then I would in fact be obligated to comply with its laws. But given that I haven't done it and basically no one has done that, we are not obliged in this way. And so therefore there's no obligation to obey the law. So that's sort of the, the philosophical anarchist position. So yeah, so that's, that's principle number one. So yeah, so the other four, the second is a view about how people can come to acquire private property. Okay. Um, so the thought is that I actually allow that people could in theory acquire private property. Um, specifically, I endorse what I call, it's called the Lockean proviso named after John Locke. And the idea is that roughly you can acquire property so long as uh, nobody is left worse off as a result of you acquiring this property, mm, okay. um, which I actually think is a very stringent requirement. Um, so there's sort of this view about how people overly, could... I mean, that's, that's intriguing. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. So I, I, I do think it's, it's pretty strong. And I have certain reasons for endorsing this. It actually has a pretty long pedigree and many different philosophers have endorsed some version of it, uh, but I do endorse it in a particularly stringent form, which in a way that I think is justified, but that's something certainly that I think other libertarians might push back against and think this is too stringent. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so I think there's this view about how people can acquire private property, but I argue that in principle, so in principle, if people can acquire private property, but because this proviso is so stringent, I actually argue, and this is thesis number three, that in fact, nobody has acquired private property successfully in terms of external natural resources. Um, Right. So people haven't acquired these external resources just because they haven't satisfied this mm-hmm. constraint on what's required to acquire private property. However, I think there's an exception. And that is that I think people actually can come to acquire their themselves, specifically their own bodies. Uh, and this gets like fairly tricky and technical in the book. Uh, but basically the idea is that uh, when you acquire your own body, you never leave others worse off in a relevant way. Uh, I can get into some details about that if you're interested. Explain so basically, the idea is acquire yeah. your own body. I'm a little lost okay. Yeah. So, that. yeah. So, so basically, the idea is on. This is a little bit of a heterodox view. So, on the standard libertarian picture of things, they usually say if you're a natural rights libertarian, you think that mm-hmm. people start off owning themselves. So the thought is, what is your relationship to your body? You own it, just in the sense that you have the set of rights over your body that you would have over a standardly owned thing. So when you own something, you have the permission to use it however you'd like. You have a claim against other people using the thing without your consent. And you have the power to sort of waive these claims and transfer them to other people. Right. So I own a thing. I say, you can't use this. Sorry. Oh, but actually now I can give you permission to use it. I can even sell it to you if you want, uh, if I want. (laughs) Um, And on sort of, there's, there's some questions about whether or not people fully own their bodies in this way, but usually libertarians who are inclined toward natural rights positions want to say, yeah, these, you have these rights over your own body. You can do whatever you like with your own body. Uh, You know, you can modify it however you want. You can destroy it if you want. Uh, Other people cannot, you have a right against other people using your body. Uh, If they sort of use your body without your consent, they wrong you. And you have the power to waive these rights. So you can say, oh, yeah, I consent. I give you permission to sure. you know, give me a tattoo or give me a kiss on the forehead or whatever. Um, right. So the thought is you sort of the thought on the sort of standard picture, you start off with the set of ownership rights over your body, and then you can extend this ownership out into the external world. So the thought is all these things out there that are all these natural resources, and they start out unowned. Um, but then you can come to acquire the same set of ownership rights over things. Uh, and there's different stories about how you can come to do this. Uh, but that's kind of the thought is, you know, maybe you mix your labor with the thing. Maybe you stake a claim. Uh, but regardless, you can kind of say, oh, now I come to own this field. Now I come to own this house. Uh, and similarly, you know, you're now excluded. Other people are excluded from using this thing. I now own this thing. Um, and so that's the standard libertarian picture. 
But in my view, I think that there's a weird sort of asymmetry here, right? Which is that it's, it's odd that you sort of start off with some with property in just this one particular thing, your body, and then all other property you have to acquire. And in my view, I think actually, why not think that these things are of a kind? If it's the same set of rights, why not think that they have to be established with respect to both all things? Um, so in a way, like, you know, you kind of wake up, you become this, con your consciousness emerges. It happens to be kind of situated in a body. Um, but, you know, you might think that body is just one more bit of the world and you happen, you know, it happens to house you. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you own it. But I argue, well, actually, you come to own it by staking a claim to it. So in just the same way that you would come to own any other external thing, you can come to own your body. Um, and in fact, I think people necessarily can own their body. In any case, people are able to own their body in virtue of the fact that they can appropriate it in a way that satisfies this Lockean proviso. You can own your when you appropriate your body, you don't leave anyone worse off, so you can come to own it. So I kind of give this story about how it is that people come to own themselves, which I think is an attractive feature of my view in a way, rather than just sort of starting off with the stipulation that people own themselves. I'm like, yeah, people come to own themselves and here's how they do it. Um, so that's number do you need to mix your labor with your body in order to stake so, a claim to your body? So I, I, I actually try to stay neutral on this on this point a, li a little bit because I think, yeah, there's many different theories about exactly what you have to do to acquire property. I'm probably more sympathetic to the idea that you can come to own property just by staking a claim and asserting ownership and control over a thing. Um, and that's – so I work a little bit with that loosely in the book. So basically I'm, I, I, I'm tentatively say you come to own your body. Just once you make this assertion and you say, like, you know, when you're like, stop it, like, you can't do this to me, um, which I think actually can happen at a pretty young age. Uh, so, you know, people sort of start to make these assertions. And I think almost everybody has made an assertion like this at some point. Um, you know, like, stop touching me, even. You know, you sort of, you're acting as though you have the right uh, to, to this thing. And I think that once you, uh, once you do that, then you acquire the thing, if it meets these other conditions. Um, but that said, I'm, tech, I'm strictly speaking, I'm neutral. So if you think that actually the way that you have to acquire ownership is by mixing your labor with things, then I actually say, well, that's fine. That's how you come to own your body. You know, when you give yourself, when you put on makeup or something, or when you, you know, when you brush your teeth, when you do these various forms of self-maintenance, that's mixing your labor with your body. And that would then be how you come to own your body. And I try to stay neutral. You know, you can sort of pick your favorite account of property acquisition. Um, yeah. And strictly speaking, I stay neutral there. I have a lot of, I don't know, I've been reading a lot about fundamentalist religions lately, and now I'm immediately picturing an example where someone is raised in a way that says, no, of course you don't own your body. You know, God does, the community does, etc. So in a version where you never stake that claim to your body in some overt fashion, do you not right. own your body then? I mean, yeah, that's pro that's probably what I would say is, yeah, I think that if, if, if for whatever reason, it's like, it's sort of unfortunate, right? I think there's other wrongs that have been done to you here in this case, if people sort of manipulate you in ways that keep you from exercising your moral powers. But I would say, strictly speaking, yes, you do not come to own yourself. Now, this might seem like a big problem, right? Because you might think, oh. Randian, sort of, but not. I'm, I've literally never heard it put quite like this. So I, <laughs> yes, there's yeah, a lot. No, it, like, it, okay. It's, it, that, that's that's totally fine, yeah. And, and you feel 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 free to poke, but maybe maybe let me preempt a particular objection because this will also draw out a little bit of the position. Uh, because because you might think, right, this is a big problem if people can't own themselves because that leaves them sort of vulnerable to all sorts of mistreatment, um, right? It doesn't give them this sort of this the crucial set of self ownership rights. But so the 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 sort of final prong of the view, the fifth the fifth principle of social anarchism is to say. In the absence of ownership rights, right, prior to if – so rather than thinking sort of the world starts out unowned with there just being no relevant rights over things, people actually start off with a set of egalitarian rights over natural resources. So the thought is that each person starts out with rights against other people using resources in a way that would leave her worse off through no fault of her own, roughly. Um, so you start off with these egalitarian rights, and then these are superseded when people acquire private property rights. So the thought is, when I then say, say, suppose that I were able to come to own a field, well, now everyone would lose their egalitarian rights with respect to this field, and I would gain property rights over it. So there's sort of the supersession model. Um, and as a result, uh, I think this serves a number of functions, and it is also independently plausible. 
but it also sort of salt addresses various worries about say that yeah the person who's manipulated into not ever asserting their self ownership and thereby acquiring their body uh, is that so technically speaking yes it's true they would not have self ownership rights over their body they would have a more limited set of rights over their body with respect to other people however they would still have egalitarian rights with respect to their body uh, right. and so as a result that means that they would still have a right against people not sort of using their body in ways that are going to disadvantage them. So that's going to give them actually still a decent quantity of moral protection against various abuses, but they will have a more limited set of rights against just say discretionary use. What um, what would that yeah. look like? Can you be a little less abstract in that, sure. in the differentiating between those two things? Right. So, so, so suppose that uh, somebody wants Suppose, yeah, that you've been indoctrinated and so you've never asserted your self-ownership rights and somebody wants to just, you know, give you an embarrassing tattoo. <laughs> okay. Well, the thought would be, say they do that, that could have a very negative impact on your life. Like people would judge you, that you'd right. be less attractive, um, right? It will disadvantage you in various ways. And as a result, it's probably going to have, you know, assuming that everyone starts off equally situated, it's going to have an inegalitarian result, right? It leaves you worse off. So, and, and, through, and arguably through no fault of your own, right? So you, you never, you never consented, you never agreed. They just come up and you know quickly sort of give you the you know a rude, crude tattoo on your forehead. Well, now the thought is they've left you worse off than everyone else as a result. Sure, they created yeah. an inequality. So the thought would be that on my model of rights, you would have a right against them doing this. You have an egalitarian right against you them sort of impacting your body. And probably, presumably, this is going to rule out all sorts of invasive bodily you know in bodily invasions because most bodily invasions are harmful and as a result will disadvantage you however as you might not have a claim against certain actions that say are paternalistic and benefit you okay um, right so suppose that you are very sick um and you say because you belong to this fundamentalist religion you refuse to accept say, a blood transfusion. Um, well, if now, say, I want to go up and give you a blood transfusion because I like you and want to keep you around, uh, on if you own yourself, you have a, you have a right against me doing that uh, because you have a right against any use of your body. Uh, the, well, I have some caveats, but anyway, that, that, that gives you the rough idea. You have, a, you have a right against these uses of your body. So you could say no, and I would be morally bound to not give you a blood transfusion. Um, so you have a sort of extra degree of control over your body. By contrast, if you haven't asserted your self-ownership rights and you don't own yourself, then you wouldn't have any right against me doing this because you don't have an egalitarian right against me giving you a blood transfusion. Because I wouldn't be leaving you worse off by giving you the blood transfusion. I'd in fact be leaving you better off. Right. I'd be arguably preserving equality. Inequality would be generated if I didn't give you the blood transfusion. So in a case like that, somebody would be would in fact be permitted to give you a blood transfusion uh, against your wishes, um, which is still you know I think many libertarians will still find that a little distasteful, but it's, at least it's like I think it prevents you know assuming it, it prevents at the very least like you still have a strong set of rights against the worst uses and abuses of your body right most invasions you're going to have a right against. Uh, but just not all rights. So in some sense, you still have left less control, but it's not like people can just do whatever they want to your body because you don't own it. They can only do things in a way that are beneficial to you uh, when they sort of use your body. So again, still something that some libertarians aren't going to like, but it's, you know, in my view, not a totally absurd consequence uh, of the view. I just find it interesting, the idea that you would need to be more uh, self-actualized in order to pick the worst option in your example. Um, right. No, it is. It's a, it's a little funny, but, uh, but I do think that's the way it works out. Yeah. Like, because, in, in, but in a way I think that makes sense, right? It's like, you know, it's not totally counterintuitive to think that, you know, one of the things that sort of would justify, you know, you resisting and, ha you know, people having obligations not to do what's good, what's beneficial is you having sort of more developed capacities and having, you know, having made certain assertions and made certain bound people in very particular ways um, by carrying out specific actions. Uh, now, does, just, does, yeah. does that a 
that, does that sort of, um, I was gonna say mindset, that's not exactly the word I'm looking for, does that sort of translate more to children and people who may never, you know, have an adult average intelligence? I mean, is, is, is the principle applicable there? Yeah, yeah. So in a way, I think this is another sort of nice, actually, advantage of my view is that it handles the case of children well. Because mm-hmm, actually, I think sure. children cause real problems for a lot of natural libertarian. Yes, they do. Natural rights libertarian theories, uh, right? Because yeah, there's problems of like, why is it, for example, that the parents don't own their children, right? So suppose you're a labor mixer, right? You're see, you're a mother and you have a child. Well, you've literally created this person. Like they are the <laughs> right? fruit of your body, and there's no like real moral person there yet to sort of have any sort of assertions like the moral person kind of emerges later and it seems like well yeah why not think you own their body and then granted later they develop right i mean a lot of parents do think that right many parents do think this uh but typically those aren't necessarily libertarian parents but so that's why in a way this is why it's a challenge right is if you're a libertarian like yeah if you if you're sort of like a real hardcore like right-wing person you think yeah the the husband owns all like every (laughs) member of the family so there's no real like you know it, but it's more tr- surprising that it's like, actually, maybe libertarians have a problem here as well. You know, why not? Yes. Uh, Susan uh, Moller Oaken has a, a, g- a good chapter on this where she talks about how this is a problem for Robert Nozick's moral philosophy. It's like, yeah, why not think that mothers own their children? Um, and uh, so, yeah, so there's sort of a problem here. I mean, I don't think it's insoluble. I think there are mm-hmm. many, uh, like there are other responses libertarians can give. But I think in a way, mine gives this sort of nice answer. Where I'm like, oh, yeah, because cause so the one problem is you might say, oh, yeah, because basically I'm like, oh, yeah, here's what happens with children. Like, here's the here's the story. Children are born. No one owns them because nobody can own any external things besides their body. They don't own themselves because they're not moral person. Like, they don't have the capacities necessary yet to assert ownership over themselves. Uh, so as a result, they don't have self-ownership rights. But they still have egalitarian rights, uh, against people using their bodies in ways that will create inequality. And in fact, everyone has those rights over them. So even to say if it's a baby and there's maybe no person there to have rights uh, because they're not, they don't have enough of a developed brain to be a rights holder, sim- all persons have a right against somebody using their body in a way that will generate inequalities. So as a result, you can't just sort of harm your infant in ways that will you know, lead them to have a worse life than other people. So and either because they the infant has a right against that or because all persons have a right against you doing that. So right. actually, even on my picture, right, babies and toddlers and say the people who maybe never developed the requisite mental capacities to assert ownership, they still have moral protections mm-hmm. in a way that I think is consistent and principled, uh, right, which is which necessary really for a non-eugenics hellscape society, I suppose, to have these protections for people who can't advocate um for themselves in any way but i do have to um you know there are ambiguities and more subjectivities blood is a great example because as far as i know nobody who needs a blood transfusion has ever been harmed concretely by that blood but you know if you uh, the child has cancer and it's um it's you know it doesn't look good but we could try the chemo um, and it's going to be miserable and they probably, it'll probably just make them more miserable. You know, there's like a, a full adult gets to choose, okay, I'm going to live for three more months without this, or I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to suffer for however long and it probably won't work. You know, there, there are, there are plenty of things where yeah, yeah. this, I mean, this is, this is coming up um, here with, um, you know, abortion laws where they're acting like either a woman is in danger or not, you know, it's A or B in a medical setting. And that doesn't apply, I would say, in a lot of cases. Certainly it would in some, so. No, no, totally. And I think that's an important caveat. And in a way, this is something that I don't really deal with because you know, th- there's different ways of handling the question of how to deal with uncertainty mm-hmm. uh, when making moral decisions. Um, and I'm sort of sympathetic to the idea that there's sort of a two-layer view. So the, in my view, I'm like, the first question we have to answer is, Suppose that there were no uncertainty and you just knew what was going to happen. Assuming that there is, in fact, a fact of the matter, it's like, yeah, one thing will happen. We don't know what it is, but there's this thing that will happen. I want to say that there's one layer of moral theory where there's a question of, okay, well, given that, what are people's rights sort of independent of our knowledge? Like, given what, in fact, will happen, what the consequences of our actions will, in fact, be, 
what actions say do I have a right against? Mm -hmm. um, right. So the thought would be like, suppose I have egalitarian rights against people. Well, that means I have a right against people using things in ways that will leave me worse off. Well, what what actions are actually going to do that? That's actually very hard because there's so much probability and uncertainty. And I would say, okay. But there's some fact of the matter, and whatever it is, whatever actions do in point of fact will, in point of fact, leave me worse off than others through no fault of my own. I have a right against people, say, doing that. Right. But then there's a second question of, well, okay, now we introduce all this uncertainty and probabilities. Well, now what should we do? And I think there's sort of a second layer of morality that's sort of that's more evidence sensitive. And I th so I think it's coherent to say both like I have a right against you doing something, and in fact, but you should you still there's another sense in which so there's one sense in which you say you shouldn't do that. Um, I'm oversimplifying a little bit here the connection between rights and what you should do, but we'll we'll, we'll set that aside. Yeah. So the th I have a right against you doing something. Supposing there's one sense in which you should not do that thing, but there might be another sense in which you should do that thing, which is relative to your evidence. And I think those are compatible. And I think we should just need to be clear that, yeah, maybe there's actually two senses of should, two senses of ought. There's what you ought to do sort of as a matter of fact, and there's what you ought to do relative to your evidence. Um, and I think both both sort of play a role in terms of our practical guidance. Um, and there's questions about which of these, you know, what the relationship is between these two different sorts of ought and say our reactive attitudes, like what do we blame people for? Should we blame people for doing what they, you know, should we blame people for doing what it is that they ought to do sort of in an objective sense, um, but when it's not what they should have done in the sort of epistemic sense, in the subjective sense, given their knowledge? There's lots of open questions there. But I'm like, we could sort all that out. We just need to keep sense of, yeah, there's, there's both what are people's rights, and then there's what should we do given our beliefs? Um, yeah. And the latter is a much harder question. I don't really deal with that. I kind of, I'm, I'm like, let's try to figure out what our rights are, assuming we know what the consequences of actions are and then leave it to other theorists to sort out, okay, what should we do when our evidence is limited and you don't know, you know, whether or not the chemotherapy will work, you know, what should right. we do? Um, or I always want to go to, we, we live in a society as they say. Um, and even like, I know that, um, I always joke that there are like seven different Murray Rothbards and the only full book I ever read by him was for a new Liberty. That's early 1970s Rothbard where he's not as left wing as he was, but definitely not as right wing as he became. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people who think libertarians, um, you know, love pollution. I, I, I used to point to that. Well, you know, he talks about how that's an aggression, but in a, in this sort of society, you know, where we need a lot of energy to keep at the, I mean, there's an incredible number of trade-offs that, I mean, I don't know if you resolve that through some kind of equation, you know. I, I in fact, know. I will say, I in fact do try to resolve the pollution problem through an equation in the book. So Maybe that's it. I mean, yeah. I don't... Exciting, exciting teaser. The, the details of that get a bit technical, <laughs> so it's probably too, too much for the podcast, but for, for interested parties because okay. yeah, because i do think that's a real problem for natural rights sure because but and that's a problem i feel like even setting aside the question of prob like probabilistic things there's just this mm. question of like yeah we might know all the facts and there's still this problem of oh if i own myself and i have a right against people sort of you know using my body which plausibly is construed as people you know impacting my body in various which ways right so like, many things but yeah you can't like pollution right because it seems clear you can't like throw just bombard me with you know, rocks, right? You can't just impact <laughs> right. my body, but then why can't you drive a car past my house and jiggle my body? Right. Why can't you <laughs> breathe? Why can't you breathe and exhale? Like why, why do I not have a right against you breathing and exhale, hitting me with your carbon dioxide molecules? Why don't I have a right against you turning on your light across the street and, you know, bombarding my poor little retinas with all these photons. <laughs> right. um, and I think that's a real problem. And it's one that I actually yeah, try to solve in the book. Um, yeah, so that's another teaser, teaser. I'm doing lots of book promotion here, as you can see. That's, it, it is brand new, right? So, I mean, that's... Yeah, yeah, out, out published this previous November. Um, okay, and it's free, free to read it online, so that's another... We will definitely link to that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I want to pester... I want to... I don't want to go backwards, but your property thing, I already want to poke at because... Great. I don't have a very tidy way of proving this, I suppose, but 
I think I'm starting to realize that I look at, say, consumer goods, the body, and, say, land as three different varieties of property. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe a fourth category is, like, children, adults who aren't fully, um, you know, uh, mentally uh, adult level. And um, even animals in terms of, you know, their property. But if you... um, you know, it, it, if you torture them, that's that's probably different than um, hitting your furniture with an axe. So mm-hmm. already when you say the body is sort of equivalent to property um, in the opposite direction, property is is body. Is it, though? I mean, uh, you, you seem you seem uncomfortable with with the um, any sort of self-evident rights, because that's not very philosophically deep i suppose but you know i think i guess i always just started at well it's my body and you can't prove that you have a claim on it in 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 these in these basic senses therefore i must have the only claim which is not very profound i'll grant you but right i don't know if they're all the same i guess you know yeah so there's there's a few things to be said here so there's when we talk about sort of these things being different there's different senses which we might talk about so when we say that, suppose you think that they're different kinds of property. Mm-hmm. Well, so the, we, I think it's important to distinguish between the sort of property as understood as a moral relationship um, between mm-hmm. people and the sort of actual nature of the thing that becomes the property. Okay, yeah. Right. So we might think property in the former sense, right? Under, when we think about property, I think the best way to think about property yeah, is as a set of rights that a person mm. possesses over a thing. So it's a relationship between – it's a moral relationship between a person and other people and the owned thing, right? Mm-hmm. So I have this – I have rights against other people using this thing sort of at, you know, at the most fundamental level. And then we might think that there are different s- distinctions that can be drawn between different kinds of property based upon the rights set that you give people. Right, so people might have partial property in a particular thing, in the sense that they maybe have rights against other people using the thing, but maybe they don't have any permissions to use the thing themselves. Mm-hmm. Right, that's the sort of property that somebody might have. Maybe somebody has property in the sense that they have a permission to use the thing, and they have rights against other people using the thing, but they don't have; they lack any moral power to waive these rights. Mm-hmm. So they might, and so this is actually, for example, something some people say about the body. Right? They might say, oh, yeah, well, they often think you have the ability to waive your rights, but maybe you don't have the ability to transfer your rights. Right? Right. They might think you don't have that power. So you can't, say, sell yourself into slavery, some people think. The um, Walter Blockian debate that I always make fun of him for a little bit, as if that's the highest philosophical quandary. Are slave contracts legitimate or not? Um, right, right, which is, it seems sort of silly. But in a way, I do think it kind of gets to the heart of this question of, well, what is property? What does it mean to <laughs> yes be a property and no, owner? Yes yeah, yeah. Uh, And so, yeah, so the thought is you might think that there are different sorts of property across different things, just in the sense that people have different kinds of rights, Mm -hmm. different sets of rights over different sorts of things. The rights you have over your body are not going to necessarily be the same set of rights you have over your house, which are not necessarily going to be the same set of rights you have over your dog. Um, And I think that that's, so that's one possible construal. Um, Another, there's sort of a separate question of like, well, when we talk about why somebody has these rights over things. Like when we think about what rights people can acquire over these different things, are there difference, are these things different in some sort of metaphysical way that can ground differences in terms of the rights that we have over them? Right. So you might think, well, maybe a body is different in an important way from a table. And that explains maybe why you just start out with rights over your body and you have to acquire rights over a table. (laughs) Or maybe that explains why it is that you can sell your table, but you can't sell your body, et cetera. Right. Um, so there's sort of there's there's two different questions, but they're connected, right? So mm-hmm. the, whether or not the things are metaphysically different is going to ground and support judgments about whether or not things are they're morally different in terms of their different sorts of the kinds of ownership that can be established are different. Um, I do take a bit of a sort of reductive approach where I do kind of want to say, well, actually. The sort of ownership that people acquire over these things is all the same. It's not quite full ownership, but it's something pretty close to full ownership. 
Um, and it's done in the same way. And partially that is because I don't think that there are significant metaphysical differences between sort of these things, just in the sense that in my view, I'm like, well, you know, what are they? They're, they're, they're lumps of matter out there. They're, they're, uh, they're mass. Uh, and then it seems like as a result, you know, you should be able to, they should be treated the same way. You could acquire ownership over a table. Well, now you have rights against people sort of coming into contact with the surface of this massive object. Well, why not say the same thing about your body? You have rights against people coming into contact uh, with the surface of your of your body. Uh, I'm like, yeah, that seems this seems very consistent. It's got theoretical simplicity, which I think is a virtue of moral theories, um, without necessarily losing. I think, you know, the core things that you would want out of a moral theory. So yeah, so I do kind of take a simple a simplified view, but I think that's a virtue of the theory. But that isn't to say that you might not have a view where you're like, no. Land is importantly different from, say, even objects. Land is very different from a body, and that actually leads to different sorts of property rights being applying to these two different things. Um, okay, uh, not a very good transition here, but <laughs> I wanted to poke at, um, at honestly, at markets, um, and in terms mm. of social anarchists, I tend to assume are not partial to mar uh, markets. Some people think that like a market anarchist is an ANCAP, and that's you know if you have any market, then you're you know you're some corporatist. Um, so what is a market, and do you find any forms of them objectionable? And um, yes, so I do think one of the features of social anarchism is rejecting markets, and I think that's one mm -hmm. of the core distinctions that's going to separate social anarchists from individualist anarchists and market anarchists. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's there's a few reasons for social anarchists rejecting that. So yeah, to start with like, what is, what is a market? In my view, yeah, a market is uh, any case where people own things, have rights over things, and transfer those rights to each other. Right. Um, so in a way, strictly speaking, uh, yeah, I mean, in a way, I think the paradigmatic market exchange would be where people it's a conditional exchange, um, right? So it's not just a unilateral transfer of property. I would say that's, you know, giving gifts isn't clearly a market. It seems like a feature of markets is, yeah, I will give you, I will transfer some rights to you conditional upon you doing fill in the blank. Um, given that account, I think social anarchists are going to be hostile to markets for a few reasons. Uh, I mean, the main reason sort of emerging out of my book is just if you don't think that people have private property rights over things, then mm -hmm. you think that markets can't really emerge uh, because people just, you know, to, to transfer rights to one another, you have to have those rights in the first place. And if you don't, you can't, you can't do that. Um, so in some sense, I'm resistant to markets just because I'm like, I don't think that people have the relevant rights that would let them have a market in a morally permissible fashion. Um, but I think there's other reasons as well. So, for example, I have a paper uh, called Community as Socialist Value, uh, where there's a concern that markets also have certain de deleterious effects, or at the very least, we might think that they have a structure that is morally troubling. Um, so I suggest is? that one of the sort of socialist, I think a sort of, there are a couple, a number of socialist commitments, but one I think is a commitment to community, uh, where I think community is people's tendency and willingness to help each other uh, in situations where they need help and to avoid inflicting costs upon one another. Mm. And I think that's, there's something valuable about that. Uh, I mean, there's both sort of a utilitarian case to make for it being it's good when people have this disposition, uh, but I think that also just sort of independently, it's a, a morally attractive disposition to have, to be inclined, to be disposed to help people. Mm -hmm. um, but as a result, then I think we should be very wary of social structures that are set up in such a way that people's interests are zero sum. Zero sum is slightly imprecise, uh, but ca because markets, I think, are not zero sum. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But I think that the thought would be that there are certain situations where people will struggle, where there's sort of a curve of how well people do, and there will be maybe people can cooperate, you know, they'll cooperate up to a certain point in both of their interests advance, but then there's a range in which one person's interests trade off with the others. Uh, and they sort of struggle over how well your two interests, you know, how well your interests uh, fare. I mean, so suppose you're playing Monopoly, right? Monopoly, mm -hmm. many games are structured like this, right? When you, when you play Monopoly, 
well, when we're going around the board, when you have, like, you land on my hotels, now you have to pay me. My gain is your loss. Mm -hmm. And, right, the game is sort of structured in a way that puts our interests at odds. I think this is problematic, a problematic structure, because I think when our interests are at odds in this way, it becomes in some sense rational to struggle against each other, right? In some sense, it becomes rational for me to want bad things to happen to you. Because if they don't, right, bad things happening to you is a necessary condition of good things happening to me. Um, and I think that that is sort of antithetical to a disposition to help and promote other people's well-being, right? Because it's like, in some sense, suppose that we're in a game like this, right? Well, why? every time I give you, say I, we're playing Monopoly, I'm naturally inclined to just, like, I like you. I want you to do well. So I want to, like, I just am inclined to give you money. But then I know every time I give you money, you're going to use that to put more hotels on Boardwalk. And then when I land on that, it's going to extract a bunch of money from me. Right. Right? It seems like, well, I want to give you money, but it's actually in some sense irrational to give money because you're going to just use it against me. Uh, and I think that there's sort of this a problem is that when you have these, these sort of structures that pit our interests against each other in this way, that's going to be, it's going to turn these sort of good dispositions to help each other, it's going to render them irrational. And I think that's very troubling. And basically, I think the, the complaint about markets is that markets have this same sort of structure, right? So when we're in a market, I'm trying to sell you something, you're trying to buy something. Strictly speaking, I'm trying to, if we're sort of really playing the market game, like I'm trying to get as much money from you as possible, like in a way for markets to work, like they, they work, in some sense, they work well, they work efficiently when I'm trying to, you know, get the maximum price and you're trying to pay as little as possible. Now, granted, we both benefit from when the exchange goes through, it's Pareto improving, um, right? There's, there are mutual gains. So it's not strictly a zero sum transaction, but there is a range you know, of zero sumness sort of above the threshold. Like there's a threshold above which we both benefit, um, right? Me selling it for, there's some price at which we both benefit. Mm -hmm. But then there's a big range above that where like any further price gains, I benefit and you lose. And if, if it's, you know, if it's sort of down at the base of the threshold, you benefit and I lose. And in the market, we're sort of struggling and trying to sort of, you know, get the other person to, uh, to basically pay, incur more costs for our benefit. So I think that the market has this same structure where our inter interests sort of are pitted against each other in a way that's corrosive uh, to the sort of inclination and the disposition to aid people. So I think that's the sort of second social anarchist worry about markets is that they are competitive in this way. They pit people against each other. Now, the alternate happy libertarian example um, to counter that would be overly simplistic a as well. Um, and I'm sure you know, you know, I need, I, uh, the, I made the bread and you picked the berries and I would like some berries without having to gather them. So gosh, maybe if I trade and then, yeah, we both benefited. Um, I mean... I don't want to ask you to, you know, describe restructuring both all of society now and all of human endeavors up until now, but at the same time, is there nothing to sort of the enlightened self-interest idea? And also sort of, how else would we do this? I, right. I don't want to say it's all swell now, but... Like... So so there's... there's <laughs> I, I grant the... So I'll, I'll start by granting the, the libertarian, like, important point within the pro-market point, which is you know, obviously very important that there's all sorts of informational constraints mm -hmm. uh, that markets sort of play an important role uh, in overcoming or at least sort of mitigating. Um, but I do think that the sort of, say you're a socialist or an egalitarian, right? You're going to say, well, there's a solution here where we don't have to give up division of labor, right? Okay. But it, the, the sort of, the, you might say from an ideal moral perspective, if you're, you know, you're good at baking bread, I don't know how to do that. I know where all the berries are. You don't know where to, they, to find them, and you know maybe you couldn't reach them if you, if even if you could, right? It seems like well, I should still go out and pick the berries, and you should go out and pick the bread. But the thought would be, well, there's some egalitarian way of distributing these goods. So we might think, Perhaps. okay, we look from an idealized perspective. It's like, okay, here's the cost of picking berries that I incur. Here's the cost of making bread that you incur. Uh, well, we want to compensate for both of those. So you know, if you incur a cost of X and I incur a cost of Y. At the end of the day, you should get X back at the very least, and I should get Y back, mm -hmm. and then we should distribute bread and berries, the remainder, in a way that's egalitarian, such that we're 
equally situated at the end of this process. So the thought is we still kind of do our separate things. We still sort of exchange in a way, but the thought would be we're both exchanging, trying to realize a particular egalitarian distribution of how well our lives go, all things considered, factoring in the various costs and benefits that we incur. And it seems like in a way there's, that's sort of a, I think the sort of the socialist in the libertarian socialist would say, well, you know, this is morally ideal in a couple of respects. First, it's ideal because you're trying to realize, you know, when in our view, justice requires, which is an equal distribution of things, Mm -hmm. a a distribution that realizes equality. And that's important. And that's sort of superior over market outcomes, which are not going to necessarily be egalitarian unless you, you know, you tinker with the starting inputs in just the right way. Um, You know, probably they're not going to end up being equal. And secondly, you sort of avoid this pitting people against each other problem. Because now our motives, like we're not, neither of us is struggling to maximize our income. Uh, no, neither of us is trying to, you know, and minimize our costs. Rather, we're both trying to realize a particular distribution that's good for everyone. So the thought would be, and it seems like that's a, that, that motive is fully compatible with trying to help people. In fact, they, in a way, dovetail nicely, right? It's like, oh yeah, I want to help you. And I want to realize an equal distribution. And I do both of these things by giving you varies. So the thought would be that that's sort of the egal, you know, the sort of non-propertarian, non-market solution, the thought would be is morally superior in a couple of respects. It still has division of labor, still has exchange, but it's not, it's not really a market because people aren't buying and selling. They're not trying to compete with each other. They're not trying to maximize their profit. Um, rather, they're trying to realize a particular distribution. Now, granted, all that said, how you know how do you actually that requires all sorts of information that people don't have. So, you know, it's not clear that we could actually do things this way. But at least as far as like a that doesn't sort of I I don't think that necessarily mitig- like that doesn't negate the moral critique, right? This so I think it, in a way like you know there there could be sort of a synthesis position here where you're like yeah actually markets are bad in these ways. They, you know, they rest on private property, which people don't actually have those rights. They pit people against each other. They don't generate egalitarian distributions. All that's bad. But we actually can't do your nice alternative. So this is the best we've got. I think that's a synthesis position. And I don't have any real counter to that. Because all I, the point I'm trying to make is more narrow. And I'm just trying to say, well, yeah, maybe markets are the best we've got. But they're still objectionable for all these reasons. And I think that's sort of the the heart of the socialist anar- social anarchist critique. I think that is a, a, a decent segue into my question of, without making you revamp all of society, what would going in the direction towards that moral system look like? I mean, what's, you know, what's an acceptable compromise to you politically or practically, or like, what's the right, the right way towards that? Yeah, great. So, so this is a good question, but it's also one that I sort of, I'm a little weaselly about because in some sense, I think I'm not really, I don't really see myself necessarily in the business of prescribing utopias, uh, partially because I don't see, like many political philosophers do, and that's their aim. Mm -hmm. Uh, But in my view, I think it's partially, I'm like, I don't know if it's the function that moral theory is really supposed to serve because almost all of us, very few of us are actually in a position to realize a utopia. Like we don't get to just impose our favored system. So in a way I view the, the sort of anarchist position that I present as primarily being a, a guide to moral action sort of within existing society, right? It's like, well, what should you do? Um, and I think the answer is you should do your best to realize uh, an egalitarian distribution. Um, and the thought would be, and where people don't necessarily, they in fact do not have private property rights standing in the way of that. Mm-hmm. So in my view, the question is often going to be something like, well, you know, suppose that, I mean, suppose that, you're in a situation where, uh, you know, you could commit theft, in, but in a way that would actually be egalitarian in its orientation. Um, in a way, sort of to put a, a colorful gloss on it, suppose you're a Sam Bankman Freed type figure. I mean, mm-hmm. granted, I'm going to idealize Sam Bankman Freed a little bit from what it seems like he was actually, in fact, doing. But there was a particular conception of Sam Bankman Freed for a while, which is, oh, I've created this sort of crypto empire and i'm going to take those funds and use it to sort of help improve people's lives 
and for a while specifically, you know, it was like people in the sort of developing countries who don't have resources, right? You take all the money that you make from being a crypto giant, you give it to give directly and or give well, and then it funds people's and sort of improves people's lives. Um, now, suppose that you make it more realistic and it's like, it turns out that actually, in fact, he's scamming people, right? And he's right. taking in money and, you know, it's, I don't know the exact details of what he's doing, but, you know, suppose you're just running a general Ponzi scheme. You're promising people that they're going to get these big payouts, but you're, you know, that it's not going to happen. Well, there's a question of, is that action moral or immoral? And in some sense, my answer is going to be, that would actually be a moral course of action. Uh, why? Well, because granted you're in some sense taking people's private property in the sense you're taking their money, but people don't actually have private property rights on my view. So you don't actually have a moral reason not to take these things. The laws tell you that you can't do this, but if you're a philosophical anarchist, you don't think the state that the laws bind your actions. So again, there's again, not a moral reason not to do this. And in fact, on my view, people have these egalitarian rights over natural resources. They have a right to their lives, to having the resources such that their lives will go as well as everyone else's. Clearly people in developing countries who are, you know, suffering from hunger or malnutrition, et cetera, they're not living those lives. So they should have those resources. So in a way I'm like, yeah, Sam Bankman frieds actions, in fact, he's making sure that people's rights are not violated. So in, it's, it's arguably, in fact, obligatory action, supposing that this is what's in fact what he was doing, which it's not at all clear that he was. Right. So in some sense, I'm like, I'm trying to give a guide for people about how to live in actually existing societies. And I shy a little bit away from utopian planning. And partially, I think that's because if you're serious about being an egalitarian, it's extremely hard to figure out what mechanisms would realize and sort of egalitarianism in a good way. I have some ideas about what this might look like in ways that we might sort of move more in this direction. Uh, but uh, yeah, some that hopefully I'll develop. Uh, I, I don't want to sort of present them now because they're, they're not, it's, it's, you know, it's still under development, but I think it's, it's a really hard problem. So instead I'm like, yeah, the, the, for anarchists and maybe socialists generally, egalitarians of all stripes, the relevant question is just what should I, what am I permitted to do and what am I obliged to do? And I think the answer is, yeah, take resources and channel them to the people whose lives are going worse than other people's. Be, be Robin Hood. I mean, there's your, there's yeah, your it, right. Exactly. It's, in some example. sense, it's a, Exactly. That's that's maybe a better example. Yeah, yeah. It's a de, it's a defense of Robin Hood, which is very different from like being like, here's my utopia. But in a way, I think it's it's more relevant to our actual lives. So Probably that's so. my my justification for sidestepping this, you know, good, totally fair and reasonable and important question. So um, I guess maybe it goes back to the equation and pollution thing, but I'm now thinking about, you know, I want, there's a field and I want to use the field and you want to use the field. And at some point, we'll have too many people to use the field or the field is used up. How would your philosophy deal with, with the sharing, you know, the, the commons or not the commons, but um, you know, how, how are we going to do this? And Again, I don't want to be a libertarian cliche, but um, I always start thinking, okay, someone's going to someone's going to yearn for some central planning because they think they have that information. And, you know, we, we go in that direction. We go into, you know, state socialism or whatever you want to call um, authoritarian countries. Probably not that. Um, I mean, how, right. how no, do we. How do we yeah, no, it's, this, this is a good question. And again, this is where I kind of I do sort of sidestep my way. I, I, I kind of stay in the realm of ideal theorizing because mm -hmm. I want to say, well, I mean, I'm interested in the moral facts. And then when it comes to the actual pragmatic ways of, you know, sort of acting morally, that's a, that's a harder question. But I want to say, so say in the field case, I want to say, well, it, when it's, you've got this field, these uses happen in chronological order. Uh, and for each use, we can, in some sense, ask, well, what are, you know, what are the consequences going to be of this use? Um, and we might say, well, you know, will this use leave other people worse off? Uh, and you build Congo, and <laughs> I can't play football on the lawn because you built up on the field. I mean, right, exactly. And then we could sort of say, well, yeah, and then how does this affect our different levels of well-being? Would it be an egalitarian? Would it have an inegalitarian consequence? Um, yeah, strictly speaking, I think the question is, would it allow for an egalitarian outcome? Because there's this question of like, well, what are other people going to do? There's like, we can't necessarily sort of assume that people are going to do any particular thing. But the thought is, I think any time I use resources 
I have to leave open of the possibility, like I have to leave it open such that other people acting upon their rights. Um, well, actually, no, I don't. I don't want to say that. I want. Sorry, this this it, it, things, things get a little technical here. But yeah, the loose idea is, you might say, what do I expect the outcome to be of my action in terms mm-hmm. of? Yeah, this is probably the better way to put it. What what do I expect the outcome to be of this action? What is given the evidence available? Like, what is the what should one expect this action to do? If it's going to have an inegalitarian outcome, then people have a right against me doing that. Mm-hmm. If it's expected to have an egalitarian outcome, then it's fine and I'm permitted. And the thought is that you can then just apply this to every use of the field. Now, there's a real hard problem knowing, well, what is the, what are the actual consequences going to be of using the field in this way? Um, but I think in principle, there is an answer. And in principle, we can say, yeah, people just have a right against whatever uses of those fields are going to be an egalitarian in terms of their consequences. Um, so, so yeah, so that I sort of sidestep, uh, but it, it, yeah, there are quite, there are serious epistemic problems here with respect to the state socialism issue. I mean, I think that's a, that's, that's a fair point as well, which is once we start to say, well, okay, we want to regulate the use of resources in an egalitarian way for some people the, the thought is going to be like, yeah, I, and I've got this figured out and I'm going to in fact regulate these things in this mm-hmm. way. Um, but in some sense, I'm going to say, well, what matters is whether or not they're right. So if if they're right, and in fact they are, they do they do know what which uses of those resources are going to be egalitarian and inegalitarian, and they do stop people from using using resources in all and only those cases that would be inegalitarian, then that's fine. There, that's that's a totally legitimate thing to do to respect people's to sort of protect and respect people's rights. Uh, if it's if they start overreaching and become a totalitarian and they're and they're wrong and they in fact create inequalities um, or otherwise you know interfere with people's rights, then they've acted wrongly and they shouldn't do that. Um, which is so that's a bit of a cop out, but I'm like, well, yeah, it's it's fine to regulate resource usage as long as you do it the right way. Um, and then I think that sort of the insight, the important thing for people to keep in mind, just from the sort of epistemic side of things, is like, yeah, we you know you have to be extremely careful and you should you should be very modest when trying to determine what in fact is egalitarian and inegalitarian before you start regulating resource use. Um, yeah. So that's, that's sort of the, again, a bit of a cop out, but I think that's the, I, I think that's what the sort of ideal theorist is going to say or, and should say. Um, I want to circle back a little bit just so I can um, focus in on some of the things that you've kind of hit, but um can you sort of specifically talk about how um, engaging with, I don't know if we want to call it right libertarianism, American libertarianism and mm-hmm. or a- anarcho-capitalism or market anarchism, how um, has that shaped sort of your anarchism now? I mean, what's the, what would it look like without those influences, I guess? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, like, great. Try to synthesize them. Um yeah. So, I mean, I think the, I mean, it, it does in a way play a central role. So I think that like, for example, the philosophical anarchist position that, you know, right, the view that states don't have the power to impose obligations on you. I mean, that's, I think, a core sort of right libertarian insight, you know, that's defended, mm-hmm. um, you know, very most forcefully and consistently by right libertarians. I mean, I think many, uh, you know, left-leaning people are certainly amenable to this idea, but it takes it sort of, you know, right libertarians, I think, have given it some of its strongest and clearest articulations. For example, there's Michael Humer's book, The Problem of Political Authority. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's John Simmons's book, Moral Principles and Political Obligations. Um, You know, there's sort of some of the leading figures pressing this point. Uh, And I think that's, you know, I think that plays a very important role in general anarchist thought, uh, both in terms of sort of explaining the relationship between, you know, what are our obligations to the state? Very limited. Um, and also, I think it, it, in my book, this sort of idea of uh, the consent, you know, the sort of the denial, philosophical anarchism and the denial that states are legitimate also plays a role in explaining why it is that, in fact, people can't acquire private property. Another teaser. So, in fact, Perhaps. like, you know, it, it, it plays. I, so this is sort of an example where you sort of, of a, one of the premises that libertarians endorse uh, that I think if you endorse it and take it seriously actually leads you to a sort of an anti-propertarian social anarchist position. So it's very central. 
Um, I think uh, similarly, like, um, you know, the idea of self-ownership, I think, is something that is very attractive, I think, is at the heart of social anarchist thought. Um, and again, that's a view that's been sort of, I mean, most prominently expounded by right libertarians. Um, I mean, even the sort of the framework of sort of viewing our rights about starting to think about our body, the rights of our body and noticing that there's an analogy between the rights that we are, the sort of plausible set of rights we want to assign people over their bodies and the rights that private property holders possess. Mm -hmm. um, observing that analogy, I think it's an important libertarian contribution. And then just affirming that people in fact have those rights over their body and defending it is a key libertarian contribution uh, that social anarchists and critics of markets and private property in general, should still welcome, right? Not mm -hmm. my view. Like, we should not reject private property about external things, but welcome it when it comes to the body. So, I think those those are insights. And finally, just quickly in general, like, I think that right libertarianism plays an important dialectical role because there are lots of important right libertarian. Like, you can't be, I think, a a good critic of markets and private property without having a really good understanding of the defenses of markets mm -hmm. and private property. Um, and understanding those things are, you know, that's crucial. And so, you know, right libertarians play an important dialectical role uh, without understanding those things, then your position is very shaky. I was, I was going to ask you to give the most charitable version of <laughs> ANCAP or right libertarianism, but I think you've been pretty charitable already. Um, so instead, I kind of want to ask you, what kind of conflicts have you found with people on the left and other social anarchists? Like what, 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 what do you, what do you um, argue that has, has caused them to be like, wait, what? Um, oh yeah. So th that's a good question. I mean, the, the, the clearest example is that I have a final chapter in my book called a state tolerant anarchism, uh, where it's sort of a very modest defense of the state in some mm. respects. So it, it basically very quickly, the idea is that, I think the states are illegitimate. They have no ability to impose obligations upon you. But there's another question of, well, should we get rid of the state? Right. Uh, and I think the answer to that basically is I'm like, I think it depends. And it depends on what the state is doing. Uh, yeah. And in a way, I push for a very sort of fine grain where I'm like, yeah, states, there is in theory a state that acts entirely justly. So whatever, say you're any variety of libertarian or anarchist, you know, there, there's in theory a state that does all and only those things that you think a state should do that or the, not a state that you think any agent should do. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, if a state does that, it seems like there's no basis for objecting. We shouldn't object to it just because it's a state. Um, and so I'm like, yeah, we should actually be tolerant. You know, so if you see a police officer and it, I, I'm actually inclined to look sort of on a fine grained, like a fine grained action by action basis. I'm like, yeah, if you see a, if you see a police officer and they're stopping, you know, an assault, you shouldn't, you know, you, you definitely shouldn't go up and like, you know, disable the police officer. You should right. let them do that. You should in fact even help them, right? If they say, quick, yeah. quick, I need, pass me that rope. You know, you should pass them the rope if that in fact will stop a rights violation from occurring. Um, so, you know, basically in, in short, my view is I'm like, we should, we should view the state as we, you know, because it's not legitimate, we should understand the state basically as a big street gang. It's very well organized. It tries to control a lot of territory, though it does not in fact control the territory. There's many sort of little sub-state actors who, you know, are operational. Um, so, but yeah, so it's basically a large gang that tries to control some territory. But anarchists shouldn't object to gangs on principle. Gangs, they can be fine. Yeah. You know, that gangs are just, they're just a group of people doing stuff together. Anarchists <laughs> have no objection to that. It's just once they start violating rights that you should try to stop them from violating those rights. Maybe you should disband them all together if that's the only way to stop them from doing rights violations on net. So in that case, there is, I think, some case for dismantling the state potentially. But at least in principle, the mere fact that you have a really large group of sort of armed people who are trying to coercively regulate a particular territory, I'm like, that is that by itself is not reason for rejecting it. We should see what it is that they're doing. So I I'm mean, like, we should be tolerant. Yeah. But anarchists hate this. There's a mixture of things that I, I that, that that I think would appeal to different people. Um, to be to to slightly paint uh, right libertarians unfairly, I feel like sometimes I've encountered um, the state is illegitimate. Therefore, everything they've ever done is equally morally bad, which, as you just said, is is a very silly thing. 
Right. And there's no conflict. You can believe, you know, the um the the cop who is stopping the assault draws his salary from tax dollars, which you have paid, you know, and there's you can get into some thing you didn't sign up for. Um, but he's still, you know, saving that child from being beaten up and stuff. So that feels rather instinctual that some things, um, you know, to me, but I, I don't know. I, I think, I, I think it's good that, that sort of all the other stuff you said, the egalitarian plus um, principle working together. I think that is a case where it actually in the world that it, that is the way it works because I mean, yeah, yeah, no. Some I, things are worse than other things, <laughs> right? I, I will, I will say, I do think that in cer- there are certain views where, like, if you're an ANCAP, you know, then you might be more inclined to think that states just necessarily violate people's rights if you think that states require taxation, uh, mm-hmm. and that's sort of an essential feature of states. And like, you can't really like anything if you think that anything that doesn't tax is just not a state, mm-hmm. uh, which is not totally implausible. Then I'm like, well, yeah, in that case, maybe. You think that states necessarily violate rights. And then there's a question of, well, but do they also pre- preclude the violation of rights? And does that weigh against the violation of rights um, in a way that matters? I think different people might give different answers to that question, but there's more of a case. But in a way, actually, I think that if you're a social anarchist, there's a little bit less of a basis for opposing the state. Because if you're like, well, because then you're not necessarily opposed to taxation in principle, right? You're like, yeah, resources should just right. be regulated in an egalitarian way. But that opens the door for paying, you know, you could pay police officers salaries, um, without necess- necessarily violating people's rights, right? You could, they could, they're just sort of, their salaries are being paid because they're doing egalitarian things. So it's an egalitarian use of resources to kind of keep them fed and clothed and housed so that they can ensure that, you know, resources are used in a just and appropriate way. So in a way that it's, it, there's an interesting sort of asymmetry there. Um, but yeah, I think for the social anarchists, there's more of space for being like, oh yeah, here's this thing that looks a lot like a state. It's got armed, uniformed people trying to regulate things. They're using resources to do it. And all of that is fine as long as everything they do is strictly egalitarian and respects people's rights. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've encountered um, a lot of sometimes mainstream Democrats, sometimes farther left people who seem to sort of think that if you change anything about the state, then it will all crumble um, in a way. Um, and that that has never inspired a lot of confidence in me in, in taking control of those mechanisms and changing a state into a non-malevolent force. Um, you know, well, we have to let the warfare happen along with the welfare, because how could we possibly only have one? Um, right. That's a very frustrating yeah, no, exactly. And I think that sort of same to- totalizing view can be a bit of a trap that even yet yeah, anarchists can fall into a little bit is, you know, in the extreme form. It's like, yeah, the state does all these bad things. So therefore all states must be abolished. And I'm like, well, at least in theory, in theory, maybe not in practice, but in theory, we could imagine the sort of the, the minarchist state, right? In a mm-hmm. way, like the, the so I think I heard somebody on Twitter once categorized this, my view is something like a socialist minarchism. Mm. Uh, which I kind of like, where it's like, yeah, you can imagine the state where, in fact, we just slowly pare down all of the bad things it does until only sort of an egalitarian self-ownership respecting core remains. Would that not be a state any longer? I'm like, no, I think it would still be a state. And state would you have any, right, right, very state. state-like. And would you have any reason to abolish it? Seemingly not. It's just a gang doing realizing justice in a way that's like what we should all aspire to like we should aspire for our friends to like get together and be like a gang that realizes justice (laughs) um i mean that could go awry of course as these things do right you get yeah you have to actually do it you have to you have to realize justice if you if you're not doing it then you're acting wrongly and so then there's the sort of second layer of like well what should i actually do given my limitations but if you're actually out there just realizing justice like great go yeah go go do it I mean, I've been turned fully off of accelerationism and anything like that. Um, but you can also be too cautious, of course, in terms of, of the changing of things. Um, right. It's a, it's, a, it's a really tricky balance of not being hubristic about what it is that you're able to do, but also not then just being like, well, I guess things are just going to let just got to let things unfold. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's tough. But I, th- I think there's a needle to be thread there where you could be very careful and gather enough evidence before you start you know, regulating other people 
in a way that will hopefully promote justice. I just get generally touchy because um, every I think a lot of leftists are very casual about the concept of revolution and the most um, ideologically, uh, morally good revolutions have, I mean, they always go awry and very nasty things happen. So, yeah, no, I, I agree. And I feel like that's definitely a, an example of, yeah, the kind of hubris and, you know, the dangers where it's like, yeah, you're trying to do something good, but you in fact do something really bad. Yeah. So that I definitely temperamentally am much more inclined to sort of incrementalism and, you know, kind of, uh, uh, it's not as uh, attractive, but it's probably (laughs) right. Little strategies of, you know, trying to build the new world within the own, like how can, how can I create slowly expand, create a bubble wherein, you know, just relations obtain between people. And then how can I just steadily expand this bubble? And I think that sort of would, you know, you know, drifting a little bit toward more utopian theories. And I feel like insofar as I'm interested in building, you know, a new utopia, I feel like that kind of strategy is the one that would be most, um, right. Is the sort of incrementalist strategy. I feel like it's the safest, the most mm-hmm. plausible, the one that you could actually do successfully. Um, I feel like that's really the path forward. And I actually feel like in recent years, like there's been a turn in anarchism toward this in terms of the movements people actually carry out. Like I feel like we've in the last five years, there's been a big turn toward mutual aid, toward mm-hmm. direct redistribution of resources, people, you know, taking things to give to other people. Um, and I think that there's been there's been a sort of a de-emphasis on like, oh, let's just destroy the system. Obviously not. That's, I'm making a generalization. There's many people who still are revolutionaries, uh, but I do think that this incrementalism um, is having something of a moment. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah. Um. Oh. Uh, oh my gosh, I had one one more. I was going to ask you um, just for a minute as we move towards the wrapping up of things about um, how. Uh, <laughs> anarchism works out for you uh, being a college uh, person. I mean, like the political Mm. um, environment that you are in, um, there's a lot of very tedious uh, U.S. stories about colleges and stuff. So, I mean, do you find yourself clashing against um, your other uh, teachers and stuff? I mean, do you, is your, are your views, um, are, are they welcomed? I would say it's it's been fine. I mean, it's, it's hard to say. It's a good question because there are many, there are lots of unknowns. Uh, yeah, so being an anarchist academic, um, in my current department, I mean, they hired me recently, mm-hmm. so they, they, they don't have any issue. There are big questions. You know, I do wonder, were there places that did not hire me because of my views? It seems possible, but hard to, hard to know. Um, so... There aren't too many sort of strong ideological clashes that I've experienced, uh, at least locally. I mean, also temperamentally, I'm also not particular. Like, I'm not really a bomb thrower. Uh, <laughs> I, I have certain sort of you know radical moral views, but in practice, you know, they don't. It doesn't really affect my day to day practice that mm-hmm. much. Um, in a way, at least in a way that it will affect others and like cause problems with others. Yeah. I think probably one of the biggest tensions between being an anarchist academic is you are put in a position where like you're an authority figure and you have to give grades to people uh, and you're, you're, you are sort of coercively regulating them in a way. And I don't like doing that, but I don't Mm -hmm. have too much of a choice. Um, In the past, I've sort of pushed a little bit at the edges sometimes and tried to sort of, you know, grade people in a way like on effort or pass no fail, like ways that sort of diminish the extent to which I'm like regulating their behavior. But you know, at the end of the day, like it's, it's hard to do too much of that and, you know, be able to continue to work in a university. So that's sort of the hardest part. Uh, but there still are things that, you know, I think you can do as an academic that soften that edge. Um, so for example, I always give people the option to democratically change the way that the readings that we cover, uh, mm-hmm. or, you know, the way that the sort of the assignments that we do, I can't, they can't control their grades because then that's an administrative <laughs> problem. But I mean, in a perfect world, that's what I'd like, but uh, yeah. So there, there are ways, I think, to sort of incorporate that practice, but I do still have to function as an authority figure in many respects, and that's sort of unfortunate. I really viscerally don't like it, but I sort of do it. 
I imagine a college classroom is pretty on the scale of things that are being consented to. That's probably better. <laughs> Yeah, More yeah, and, than most uh, a lot of gatherings of people's. No, no, I I agree. I th- I think that's true. And there, I mean, there's decent exit op- exit options for people. Like the exit options aren't terrible. I'd feel better if the exit options were better. Like if if there were in fact just say like no college premium, right? And mm-hmm. like you you weren't going to earn more income at all from going to college in general. Sure, then yeah. and people were really just doing it because they want to learn stuff. Then I'd be kind of like, yeah, okay, you've agreed to this, and you're not yeah, being in yeah. in uh. But it, yeah, and so as long as there's like some degree of like, you know, if there's some threat of, that induces people into going to college who would otherwise maybe not go to college because they're just, you know, scared about in, having economic security, then I do have reservations about giving them bad grades and That's including fair. them. Fair. Yeah. Um, I uh, yeah. actually failed to ask you how long you have been in um where you are and if you've ever only, taught in the u.s i'm actually it's, it's i'm a recent hire so i i because i've only finished my phd pretty recently i got my phd in 2020 so prior to that i was i was getting my phd and i was teaching classes at brooklyn college in new york mm-hmm. city uh and then i went and did a postdoctoral fellowship for three years uh, in ireland and then just this previous summer uh well northern hemisphere summer i started work in new zealand so i've only been here about it eight months i want to say um, have you found less. differences um between there and ireland and the u.s out of curiosity politically I philosophically do, my my initial impression is definitely that new zealand is a little bit more egalitarian in character mm-hmm. um people seem to care a lot more about fairness uh okay and uh yeah I, I mean i don't know if this is an isolated thing for example but like when i was on my very first flight over here uh, I was on the flight and they were doing meal service and, you know, if, if on meal service, typically they sort of serve food from the front to the back. Uh, and so they're like, oh, we're serving food from the front to the back. Uh, but then they made a big point of being like, but the next meal we'll do, we'll serve from the back to the front because, you know, sometimes they like run out of the relevant meal by the back and they're like, mm-hmm. and that's not, you know, they're like, so that way it's fair, you know, it's fair for everyone to get an equal opportunity to get the food that they want. And they, they must have said this like five times. Like they really like <laughs> hammered home, like how important it was that they were being fair in the distribution of meals. And I think there's, there's sort of a general sort of tendency there um, in New Zealand. Yeah. People don't necessarily want to uh, stand out as being a real high performer. Uh, mm-hmm. They tend because they are worried, I think about the unequal social relations that that creates. Um, people actually call it tall poppy syndrome. The tall poppy gets cut down. Sure, there's yeah. negative attitudes to people standing out too much um yeah so there's been a sort of that's an interesting political difference um there's also a general i think much more uh of a concern about how the sort of indigenous people of new zealand are treated the maori uh yeah. among sort of people who are not indigenous there's much more of an interest in trying to create a sort of bicultural society and incorporate maori language and concepts uh into sort of you know the sort of later comers culture um mm-hmm. and so that's been very interesting um yeah and in general i think people are a little bit i don't know i i'm I, again I've, i haven't heard that long but i have a vague theory that because it's a little bit more of an egalitarian culture and it's a little bit more socialist and leaning uh you know there's less inequality there's socialized healthcare, care etc i think that leads to less sort of competitive behaviors in general uh mm-hmm. among people so for example uh you know i taught this big intro class and out of 250 people, uh, I think I only got two complaints about people's grades. Uh, and uh, and one of them was an American exchange student. <laughs> well, like if you're in America, you know, you have a class. If you have a class of 250 people, you're going to be besieged with people really? complaining about their grades, I would say. I mean, it, different universities will vary in this. But yes, there's there's a, a many people are much more concerned with trying to you know, squeeze out the maximum grade they can get. And in a way, I understand that impulse. Like I was like that growing up because I was like, yeah, there's a lot of pressure for me to do well because, you know, on some level, I was like, yeah, the, you know, the better you do, the better your chances of achieving economic security. Um, Yeah. So I do think there's an interesting sort of difference there. So yeah, those are the big, the big sort of political sort of social differences that I've noticed though. Again, grain of salt, limited, limited uh, perspective. Sure. Um, I was going to 
was going to try to move towards the end, but I have an enormous question that I failed to ask you, which is, so I'm just going to, I guess I would say that I'm someone who doesn't prioritize equality and fairness, but especially fairness as the highest sort of goal. Um, I think there's a lot of very casual allusions to equality from like, you know, your average Joe Biden type of human that um, mm. is, there's not, they're not very deep. Um, but to you, what is, you know, what is equality and fairness? Like you touched on the economic stuff, but um, more, more philosophically, I guess, like what, what actually is equality and fairness yeah. to you? Great. So I think, you know, equality, there's, so there's many questions here. I mean, one question is just what is it that is to be equalized? So in my view, the relevant question, the relevant thing to be equalized is just how well people's lives go, all things considered. Um, where I usually construe that a little bit sort of psychologically, like how do you basically how do you feel across the course of your life? But there are other construals that other people will have that maybe things besides just how you feel matter. Um, but in general, I'm a little utilitarian in this way that I think sort of psychological well-being uh, matters, and I'm interested in yeah, equalizing that across across time. Uh, excluding certain cases. So I'm a luck egalitarian, strictly speaking. So I think that what matters is people should be equal unless they make certain sort of culpable choices. Uh, specifically, I'm worried about people who act recklessly in ways that diminish the total stock of resources in a way that makes it such that there's less to go around. Mm -hmm. And I think if you do that, then you have to internalize those costs, right? Mm -hmm. So basically it's like goods are socialized, but if you then, right, if you're diminishing that stock, you have to internalize that. So some inequalities, in fact, just and in fact required, in my view. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, if you haven't engaged in those kinds of activities, then I think, you know, sort of justice requires you living equally good lives. Um, and the reason for this, I think, is actually sort of, you know, fairly foundational, uh, just in the sense that I think that inequality is that any sort of differential treatment of persons has to be justified. Um, right. Insofar as you have a regime of coercive regulation of people's behavior, uh, insofar as you treat people differently, insofar, then that, that requires justification. And I take that to be just sort of a, a fundamental feature of morality um, is that you need principled differential treatment requires some principled grounds. Um, and so and as, as a result, I think if two people's lives end up going differently within a coercively regulated uh, system. Right, that sort of is a differential outcome that demands justification, uh, and I think some justification has to be given. And in my view, the only justification that can succeed is the point I made earlier that people need to internalize the costs of their actions. Um, but beyond that, anything else in my view is basically luck, and luck doesn't adequately justify people's lives going very differently. So that's sort of the a quick gl gl gloss of the the grounds of equality. I'm really just falling out of like what it means to do moral theory. I mean, what if um, philosophical anarchism doesn't lead to the equality? I guess, again, the enormous philosophical uh, thing is, I guess, what people actually owe to other people and how far that actually goes. You know, you can't um, tell me to give up my kidney to someone else, even though I have two and they're about to have zero. Um, is that just is that just something we we, we chat about until we uh, hash it out? Right. So actually, so actually, I I do think that that's the self ownership is this case where that can in certain cases trump equality. Um, right. So I think mm -hmm. that if you actually acquire ownership over yourself, then that can justify to people why they end up worse off. Um, mm -hmm. For th I, I, that again, it gets a little too technical, so I probably will just sort of gloss over it. So I think there is that's a justification. Uh, that overrides. So I was a little too quick when I was like, oh, it's just people's negligent, sort of negligent, reckless choices. It's sort of people's negligent choices or your acquiring of your own rights. Um, I know there might be others that I haven't considered, mm -hmm. but in general, I think there aren't that many candidates and most of the other candidates fail to justify inequality. Um, but at the very least, I do think there is sort of an egalitarian bent to morality generally, just in the sense that these differences in outcome need to be justified. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are limited justifications that can be given. Did you happen to think of um, some media recommendations um, that you can recommend to the good listeners in terms sure. of? Sure. Besides yes. your own book, which again. Right. Besides, yeah. obviously, the own book. 
uh, I mean, in my view, the sort of the my my interest in uh, anarchism sort of emerged out of a couple of different philosophers who had. So maybe I'll take the chance to like plug them. Uh, sure. And uh, yeah, so I think that there would be G. Uh, G. A. Cohen, who was mm-hmm. the sort of the socialist philosopher, and he's got a charming little book called Why Not Socialism. Uh, that's sort of short and fairly accessible. He's got a lot more technical stuff too, uh, but I think that's a good starting place. Uh, and then there's John Simmons, who's sort of much more in the right libertarian tradition. He's a mm-hmm. philosophical anarchist. Uh, and yeah, his book, uh, Moral Principles and Political Obligations, I think is sort of a nice statement of that. And so in my view, my view is sort of like a fusion of these two. Um, uh, and then, yeah, a couple of other people I'd plug is there's uh, Michael Atsuka's book, uh, Libertarianism Without Inequality, who sort of introduces okay. a left libertarian position, uh, and he's a really good philosopher. Um, and then I just have to plug Judith Jarvis Thompson's book. She's got a book called The Realm of Rights, uh, and she's she's never actually called herself a libertarian to my knowledge, but in my view is sort of a very libertarian inclination, but it's also just a really great philosopher uh, in terms of laying out sort of the fundamental sort of structure of mor- the moral world. And I think, you know, these four, like, all come together, I think, to paint a really nice picture, and I view my views sort of emerging out of the four of them into a nice, something of a synthesis position. So I'd plug all of those philosophers. Uh, if outside of, like, philosophy, uh, it's harder to say, I don't know, what would be, like, a really nice sort of social anarchist uh, parable uh, maybe I think uh, Kurt Vonnegut's got a book called God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, which I think is like a really charming, nice view. I have nice not read of... that one. Yeah, it's, it's a nice just sort of, in a way, like what what might egalitarians do within the sort of the bounds of our current society? And I think it's a really nice case study. Um, and then maybe my other, other another one I like is, uh, I don't think there's really a moral here, but it's, a re- I think, a really nice piece that anarchists of all stripes could enjoy. Uh, and it's a short story called At the Anarchists' Convention by John Sayles. Um, hmm. And it's a really sort of funny, poignant uh, short story about a gathering of aged anarchists. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Hi- highly recommend it for anybody who's interested in anarchism. Yeah, I'm going to need to write down all those things um, that you just mentioned, Cohen especially, but because I yeah. am intrigued. I yeah, like definitely. to see an argument laid out. Um, yeah, if you're, if, you're a liber- get- if you're a libertarian who's interested in sort of, you know, the seeing the socialist position really put into dialogue with, mm-hmm. uh, with libertarianism, yeah, he's a, he's a great starting point. Uh, Especially someone less dry than Marx himself, say, is always good. Um, he's a little bit less dry. I mean, all these people are, like, they're all <laughs> academic philosophers, so they're all a little dry, I have to I have to say. Uh, there aren't too many who are punchy. I mean, Michael Humer's pretty punchy when he writes. Mm-hmm. He's probably one of the least dry. I would not say necessarily that any of them are, I mean, Cohen writes with a little bit of flourish, but he's, like, mm-hmm. a little bit dry. Uh, it's not like an yeah, airport I'm, novelist. I'm, no, no. <laughs> it's probably okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and as I also, I needed in the obligatory asking, mm-hmm. um, even though you are not a utopia builder exactly, but how would I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? Right. So in the utopia, ideally somebody just gives it to you because, or somebody makes it and then you take it because everyone recognizes that that's what would realize an equal distribution. You're sleepy and cranky. Everyone else is feeling good, uh, so you you help yourself to it. I would say outside of the utopia, even in our real world, maybe you still help yourself to it. Mm-hmm. If you're, you know, if the coffee owner is, the company owner is really wealthy, and the employees, you know, aren't going to suffer as a result, and you really need it to make your life go well, then maybe you maybe you help yourself. Well, I could go for one now, so it's a compelling political argument. <laughs> that's yeah that's that's where that's where we really get you when you're when you really need coffee then all of a sudden social anarchism starts to look pretty appealing that might be true um is there anything else i can i'm gonna tell the good people to find you, you tell you tell the good people where to find you on the internet um if yeah they- i mean i'm i've got a website jesse spafford.com where i list all of my research with little summaries and uh you can link to the book you can get a link to the book there and it's free to read online um, 
I'm also on uh, the website formerly known as Twitter, uh, at, at Jesse Spafford. I'm not that active there anymore I, because of, as it's, I feel like it's sort of descended a little bit in terms of quality and indeed I have other various concerns about its management, uh, but I am still there and I do still occasionally tweet out, or I guess I should say post out my thoughts. Um, so yeah, you can find me there as well. Um, and I believe you're also on Blue Sky, because didn't I find I, you on there? I am on Blue Sky. I'm trying to transition and post more there. Uh, yeah, right. Sort of t- Twitter and Blue Sky are sort of just for idle, less developed, more informal, less careful thoughts, basically. <laughs> more more opining. The philosophy stuff is my sort of serious reflective thoughts. Those are my less serious thoughts. I'm trying to do more on Blue Sky because in a perfect world, I would like to everyone to transition over to Blue Sky. Uh, but it's hard for me to break away from the network effects of everyone. You know, so many people still being on Twitter. So, uh, yeah, yeah I, you, so- you can find me in both places at Jesse Spafford and I'm, I'll try to be more active on blue sky. So yeah, follow me there. Um, if you're interested. Well, that's, that's excellent. Uh, people can find non Serbium on both of those things. Twitter. i um, it's called Twitter, but I mean, it's, um, in, in my I also- media, <laughs> uh, Falls at non Serbian Media, one word. Um, Blue Sky, which I forever want to call Blue Ski for some reason. Um, non Serbian's also on there. And my personal accounts are on those places too, and even on Mastodon. So follow me, follow us, and follow Jesse everywhere because we have thoughts. Um, but <laughs> Jesse, thank you for joining me. Uh, I could have pestered you longer, which is always a good sign, but. Um, I guess we can uh, wrap it up here, but no, thanks. For yeah, that was great. No, I feel like we covered a lot and thanks for the thoughtful questions. Appreciate it. And yeah, I mean, there's only so much you can cover in an hour and a half. So thanks for that. Really appreciate it. listening to the non-Serbian podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe over on our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. If you're extra interested in seeing this project continue, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. But if you can't contribute financially, we still like you a whole lot. And you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy. As always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much.